Is I have several questions, uh, beginning with Virgil, and for each of our speakers uh, to, to answer. There's quite a larger number of you know, toss-up questions for the whole group, and then I'll finish uh, and come back to some questions that we'll give uh, Virgil the first shot at, and then the others may want to chime in. So uh, Virgil, this first question is about mission. Uh, and it was the question said that in Idaho Code, specifically 36-103, uh, it specifies uh, the consumptive uses of hunting, fishing, and trapping. And so the question was really about is, is, is there legislation required to change the code to expand your services to non-consumptive uses? Or, you know, you were citing a much broader mission. Uh, which has primacy and, and is there some legal standing here? So I, if the, the question, I think, is do we need additional legal authority to uh, participate in broader management of all species in the state? My interpretation of Idaho Code, which is embodied in, in that mission statement that we talked about on, on Friday, is no, we don't. Uh, the framers of the initiative, the current language in the Idaho Code is the same as that initiative. Basically, all wildlife, including all wild animals, wild birds, fish within the state of Idaho, are declared the property of the state. Again, it's our trust responsibility. The second one says they will be preserved, protected, perpetuated, and managed. I, I think that's a fairly clear uh, mission and vision uh, that was uh, written down in 1938. Certainly, the mission does say we have an obligation to ensure that there is adequate wildlife for hunting, fishing, and trapping, but it doesn't limit us uh, under this mission statement, nor has the interpretation by the commission been such through the years. That's clearly apparent in all of our guiding documents uh, uh, that we've moved forward with. So I don't believe we need to um, spend a lot of energy or time expanding that. It's pretty expansive as it is. Okay, very good. Uh, next one is again a compilation of several questions, but uh, in, in broad terms, how does the agency work with other states on issues like chronic wasting disease, migration, predator control, and, and I'm even going to throw in there a couple other forward-looking ones about have you ever considered a multi-state licensing, for instance, around the greater Yellowstone area? So that interstate cooperation. So that one comes back to me. Yeah, these are all you. Certainly we spend a lot of effort with interstate cooperation. Uh, there is a very active and expansive effort at coordinating with our sister states that have adjacent borders. We meet at least annually with all of our sister states, particularly Montana and Wyoming and Idaho get together because of our, our large mammals that we have in common. Our elk, our deer, the grizzly bears, wolves, um, fish, uh, cutthroat trout that we share across those boundaries, and, uh, and we bring our commissioners together at those meetings as well because of both the scientific and policy issues. We've got a coordination uh, with Utah and Nevada for the southern border. Uh, we don't meet quite as often with them, and it's much more narrowly focused, but it does get into the disease issues. And then certainly with Oregon and Washington because of the commonalities we have with the Columbia Basin, but more recently the commonalities we have uh, with, with some uh, bighorn sheep and wolf and elk management issues uh, uh, are beginning to take some, some leadership. And so... And the shared responsibility. The shared responsibility. So the adjacent states is huge. Throughout the western United States, we're a member of the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. And we collaborate tremendously with them. One of the probably the, the more prominent collaborations with them has been the Mule Deer Working Group, where all of the uh, best of the science folks we have among the states get together to put together our combined knowledge so we can use it in our management. We do that with bighorn sheep. Uh, federal agencies, uh, both Fish and Wildlife Service as well as the land management agencies, are ex officio members of that group and provide input. So the coordination is tremendous there, and there is a disease working group of that. And at an even a broader scale, there is national organization called the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies uh, that does the same thing as, as the Western, 
but goes one step further with full-time staff in D.C. to be sure that uh, states' rights and hunting and fishing and wildlife management issues are properly addressed in Congress. So there's a, a tiering there that, that ensures that we have good coordination across state boundaries, and we have signed compacts with a number of states relative to some of those shared responsibilities. Okay, I'll just keep it right there. Uh, w one more. A vocal minority has a disproportionate influence on commission debate, this person asserts. Uh, how can a broader audience, by which I think he means kind of more in the middle, uh, provide feedback that will be heard? In other words, I think they were saying they felt like you had to have a particular gripe to get before the commission. That's not correct. Um, anyone can approach and involve themselves in the commission. We have extensive public input opportunity um, as an agency. Uh, the commission always has public input opportunity prior to their decision making. Um, certainly it does require you to attend, but all of the written comments we receive are presented to the commission, and I guarantee you they do read them and discuss them, uh, as well as staff. Uh, our website is just phenomenal for a communication tool with the department. But on a local basis, there are more opportunities for input than most of us have time to provide for every species and action that we have going out there. And um, it's, it, it's almost too much in some cases, and we've talked about that. But certainly public input is broad. Yes, those who come and participate do get heard. And I guess some of the challenge of, of being concerned about the last person to be heard is somebody that has a narrow specter. You have to show up to be heard. But the written and other comments do get acknowledged. And uh, um, I, I would encourage you, we do have Commissioner Borowski here, and certainly if you have desires to discuss this with him later, I'm sure he would be glad to talk to you after the session. Okay, uh, and one last one uh, with you, Virgil, but others actually may want to chime in on this one. Uh, uh, with the exception of uh, my speaking about the old trapper there, uh, trapping hasn't come up all that much during the course of this conference. In the survey, uh, there was shown to be uh, significantly less support for trapping, so, so there were a couple of questions came in. Is there a way to use education to spread interest and a more positive view of trapping uh, given that it's been downplayed so far? Well, the answer is yes. The Audio Trappers Association is a, is a very dedicated group of, of sportsmen uh, out there trying to ensure that their um, type of activity is understood and, and promoted. Uh, they've been key leaders in, in what I consider progressive trapping with support for the requirement for mandatory trapper training uh, for some of our species, wolves in this particular case, uh, for getting out in front in coordination with the department, addressing concerns in urban wildland interfaces with trapping and pets uh, that is actively going on right now. And, and so communication among that user group out there with everybody else. Just because we don't have a majority supporting that activity does not mean it's not legitimate and appropriate. Uh, if you break down many of the activities that each of us does, whether it is a traditional muzzleloader or longbow archery or fly fishing with a barbless hook or however, they may be minority activities. And we have to have an appreciation for the fact that the rich heritage and tradition of outdoor-based recreation is important. And so um, I, I just, I, I think it is uh, something that we are doing and can do. Certainly hunting is overall the highly regulated and it's one of the only, one of the very few outdoor sports that requires mandatory safety education before you can go out and participate. Almost any other activity, you just walk out and start doing it. But certainly uh, trapping and hunting have a requirement relative to it to be ensured about the life history of the critter and uh, an understanding of the safety associated with that activity. 
Okay, I'm gonna uh, shift it over to uh, Jim Posowitz for a couple of questions. Jim, you seem to have gotten longer questions and <coughs> maybe that implies you're gonna tell a story in your answer. Uh, the first one is, uh, acknowledges uh, Roosevelt uh, as a leader in the late 19th century for wildlife conservation, but notes that his focus tended to be on ungulates, which if my memory serves from biology class means kind of hoofed animals, four-legged hoofed animals. Uh, carnivore conservation lagged and is still lagging today. And so the question is how can we or even should we broaden support for carnivore conservation in the 21st century? Okay, is this alive? I guess so. Okay, uh, first of all, I would start uh, with Theodore Roosevelt's carnivore hunting and tell a little story. Uh, in 1901, he's vice president-elect and at that time they didn't do the inauguration till March, and so he had a little time on his hands. He used it to go to Meeker, Colorado to hunt mountain lions. And he writes, if I can remember this, he writes on the taking of two lions. The first one he wrote, since she was doing considerable damage to the pack, I ended the struggle with a knife thrust behind the shoulder. In the second line, he said, I jammed the gun butt into his jaws with my left hand, striking home with the right, the knife going straight to the heart. So our vice president-elect just killed two mountain lions with a knife. <laughs> and when I stumbled across that piece of hunting history, I think Al Gore was the president, and I was trying to, our vice president, and I was having trouble visualizing this. <laughs> And so when I look down the roster of vice presidents and vice presidential candidates, I still have trouble. I mean, there's Joe Biden, Sarah Palin, perhaps, <laughs> and Paul Ryan. And the point, I guess, of all that would be that Theodore hunted anything he could. When he was a freshman at Harvard, he wrote home that the spring bird migration was coming, send my shotgun. And at that time, a big part of birding was collecting study skins. And uh, the idea of conservation of carnivores, though, to get more back to the, to the question, there's little evidence of that. Um, if, but you have to kind of view the temper of the times. I mean, he shifted over and had his conservation epiphany at a time when the wildlife populations of uh, and the ungulates, in particular, had been at a dismal state of uh, reduction. And we look upon parts of the West, which I talked about uh, on Friday, we were literally a boneyard. And when he shot that last buffalo in, or the last buffalo he shot in, in uh, Idaho, he was a uh, considerably different person, but still he shot the buffalo. And part of what those people were doing at that particular time was uh, collecting specimens because they thought they may not be able to restore wildlife. We know now, in the, with the benefit of hindsight, that, that we were. That they, and, and he set a course and we followed the course and, uh, and they're continuing this legacy of putting back a wildlife pyramid uh, across an entire continent. And We've got a couple pieces left to that pyramid. We're struggling now with, uh, with wolves. Lions, we made a game animal uh, in Montana in 61. I'm not sure what year it was here in, in Idaho. But we're gradually building the entire pyramid back. In Montana, we're debating wolves. We've long since you know, accepted mountain lions as game animals. Uh, grizzly bears, we put grizzly bear protection in Montana as early as 1913 when we created some uh, Sun River Game Preserve, for example. And so the last topping off the pyramid, wolves and buffalo is what uh, Montana is currently struggling with. And I think uh, it's not an abnormal progression. And while it gets a little stickier uh, because we uh, uh, you know, have a little, don't all agree to the density of those animals, 
But the fact is that we are still going in the right direction, still you know, reconstructing a wildlife pyramid built primarily on ungulates and uh, later adding on the carnivores. I think we have a lot to be proud of rather than something to uh, find differences. Sure, we're gonna ag argue about what is the proper density of these things, but that's a high class argument. And uh, I think we should be proud of what we've done out there. Ding, 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 ding. My notes say that if Jim tells that gory cougar story, he qualifies for the following bonus question. <laughs> So here it is from, from, uh, from someone else in uh, Region 1, this one. Uh, given that uh, Teddy Roosevelt killed one of the last buffalo in Idaho, what does that say about watching or actively engaging in the loss of wildlife and their habitats today? It seems a diabolical difference between celebrating a kill and his legacy of conservation. Well, the celebrated kill was the one in 1883. That's when he did the war dance around it, and that was his very first buffalo, and he was a guy who came west to hunt with a fantasy in his head. Well, I there think a killing a lion with a knife is pretty easy. <laughs> 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 well, what can you say about that? You know, if you read a lot about any one guy, you're gonna run across the war or two. But uh, I think nothing can dim the record that he has, has achieved. And granted, there, is, there was that period in wildlife conservation history that to, to sort of accelerate the, the restoration of the quote unquote game animals of the day, uh, predator control seemed like a logical component to that. And I mean, we were practicing some pretty severe methods of predator control clear up through the 1950s when we were 10 aiding uh, you know, vast areas of our, of our country. Point for Jim. Yes. And uh, we've gotten over all that, you know, and here we are talking wolves and cougars and buffalo. <laughs> okay. I think that's uh, something to be very proud of and uh, I don't think we need to apologize for it. And I think we need to be, I guess, expect less than absolute perfection of, of the people that we sort of credit for doing this uh, great service to our, to our country. You know, there's very few of them that came through without a single wart, and if you look close enough, you can find it. But the big thing is to look at the high points. That's the stuff we want to emulate, follow, and uh, perpetuate. Point served and returned successfully. Okay, uh, Jim, your last question, uh, and again, it, it came with some preparatory stuff, this one from Pocatello, around the conservation ethic and history, but the, the bottom line question was, uh, should Idaho citizens now control management of public lands? In other words, uh, Jim, do you support local control of federal public lands, an experiment that's being advocated today? Well. Well, we m maybe control is the wrong word, but as people who are local, living with uh, National Forests or Bureau of Land Management lands, we have an exceptional advantage. I mean, we can participate face-to-face -face with management issues, and uh, one example I'd give is that there's a place in Montana called the Elkhorn Mountain Range. Uh, there are questions about its management. The Forest Service formed up an Elkhorn Citizens Group for advisory board, and I serve on that. Uh, and I imagine there's all kinds of people out in this room that serve uh, on various local uh, connections to the public land managers. And so we do have an advantage. We know the terrain. Uh, timber sales are not abstracts. We know exactly where they are and what they're gonna look like both before and after. We can look at the environmental assessments, and I know it's a lot of work, but a lot of people are doing it. And I think, if anything, the future is going to require more of the non-government participation because, uh, let's face it, the agencies are being fiscally withered for, for reasons that may be justifiable or necessary. And those gaps are going to have to be filled by volunteers. And I think everybody in this room probably has served in that capacity uh, at some point in their career. And, and we'll I, be coming you, back to when that. When you get to be an old guy, <laughs> they keep coming to you. So we have that advantage now. All we got to do is show up. 
Thank you, Jim. Okay, uh, now I have uh, a couple here for uh, Tony Hardesty and the Nature Conservancy. Uh, Tony, the first one is, uh, how does the Nature Conservancy prioritize which lands to seek public access through its actions and and the person uh, t tosses out might there not be chances to work in partnership with organizations like Ducks Unlimited or the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation on areas of mutual interest yeah so there's really I guess three things that we focus on when we decide where we're gonna put our time and efforts uh, from the Nature Conservancy and it's it's pretty straightforward we look at one what's the conservation value Two, what's the opportunity there to do some good? And three, is there a role for the Nature Conservancy to play? And so those are kind of the criteria that we look at to decide what we're gonna get involved in. Uh, as far as uh, partnering with Ducks Unlimited and Elk Foundation, absolutely. In fact, um, what comes to mind is a couple things. Right now, uh, we're working with both of those organizations on an area north of Mackey. Uh, we've been working with Ducks Unlimited on the Heart Rock Ranch. Um, I think we've been working with the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation on juniper control down in the Owyhees. So those are just a few examples, and those are just a couple of the organizations that we work with. We also work with Trout Unlimited. We work with a whole host of partners on projects throughout Idaho. Um, and again, use sort of those three roles to determine when it's right for us to get involved. And on a little side note, I, I will point out there were a number of questions that, uh, in my own words, seemed like they were trying to bait Tony into trying to uh, be an unusual matchmaker between uh, uh, organizations on the fringes or, or with some fairly extreme views that I didn't think it was going to be productive to go through that drill of uh, putting her to the, the collaboration test, as it were. Uh, she's clearly working with lots of groups. Uh, but the next question, there was some curiosity about uh, your organization's policy with regard to hunting. Uh, a, does it allow hunting on its properties? And then B, a little more pointed question, do you have a policy with regard to hunting and or lethal control of predators on your land? So we do allow hunting on our properties, and it varies from property to property on exactly what we allow, depending on geography and size. Uh, so for example, our Garden Creek Preserve in Hell's Canyon, hunting, all kinds of hunting allowed there, it's totally open. Um, Flat Ranch, due to its proximity, we allow uh, duck hunting there. Uh, Ball Creek Ranch is open to all hunting. In fact, I was just talking with a gentleman earlier today who said he's headed up there for some turkey hunting um, later. Uh, Crooked Creek, we allow all kinds of hunting on Crooked Creek. You do have to check in with the ranch manager when you get there because there's a little bit of geography there that we don't allow it on, but the rest of the ranch is open. Uh, Silver Creek, we allow duck hunting as well. Uh, for example, Cougar Bay would be an area where we don't allow hunting. It's a smaller preserve. It doesn't is not um, viable there, but we do allow fishing. So yeah, we do allow hunting uh, throughout most of our preserves, and the ones we don't is just because of geography and specific examples. So. Okay, this next question uh, came from uh, Coeur d'Alene, and, and let's listen to the wording carefully. I think I've gotten it r right, but the, uh, uh, does the Nature Conservancy understand that turning its lands over to states causes a loss in tax revenues, and I think they meant county tax revenues, and is there a, a limit to the extent of you doing this? And this may be a question for more yeah, than Yeah, it might be a you. joint question. I'll, I, I will make a point to make sure that everybody knows that the Nature Conservancy pays tax revenue on all of the properties that we have in the state of Idaho. So we do pay taxes on ours. When we transfer it over to uh, Fish and Game, I'm sure Virgil would like to respond what Fish and Game does with regards to that. The Fish and Game does pay payment in lieu of taxes. Obviously, we don't pay a tax. but we recognize the importance of local tax revenue and have had uh, a long interaction with both the legislature and counties and the commission to ensure that the revenues from those working landscapes when they're transferred to state ownership are not lost to the county governments. And so on an annual basis for all of the uh, several hundred thousands of acres of land that the department uh, manages and controls uh, for sportsmen, we do write a check to each of those counties equivalent uh, to what those property taxes would have been assessed on that agricultural or pasture land or timber land as the case may be. 
Okay, the, this next question uh, I, I'm going to ask of Tony, but I think it may involve uh, uh, all of you there. Um, <laughs> it, it, it kind of playing off of uh, Jim's words, perhaps, uh, this comment, our backs are sore and our knees are shot. How can we get young people more involved with outdoor activities and conservation? Well, yeah, I, I'll take a crack at that, and I'm sure other people have uh, ideas as well. That, that has been a challenge, and that is something certainly we're focused on nationwide. Um, this is not just an Idaho problem. This is a nationwide. I mentioned yesterday during my presentation, one of the programs we've got is internships. So we're working really hard to get interns out, uh, working on the land, doing that. We do a lot of uh, events and activities on our preserves where we're trying to get kids involved. So if you go to Silver Creek, there's an opportunity every, uh, every weekend to do bird watching and tours throughout that. Um, our flat ranch, we're doing the same things, taking kids out, um, teaching them how to interact appropriately with wildlife. So a lot to be done there, but it is certainly a challenge. We're trying to do what we can um, and trying to also, again, work with other groups that are interested in that, whether it's like fish and game, teaching kids how to fish, um, those kinds of things. And, and let me broaden it just a bit. There was a bunch of related questions. How about K through 12 education on the importance of wildlife? And there's even a question perhaps aimed at, at Virgil's agency on marketing your education program. So are there others who'd like to respond? Jim. Well, I'm kind of a firm believer that what we need to do with our youth is tell the story. I mean, in my, I've been sort of trying to promote this in Montana. And when I go and review Montana history books that are used in the educational process, it's always the history of how we exploited Montana. Start with Lewis and Clark, and then we go to the fur trade, and then the miners come, and then the loggers come, and then the Aggies come. And it's always how we developed economically. And yet if you Hey, ask, I'm an economist now, come on. OK. But if you ask a Montana person to describe Montana, we don't ever tell you about the Berkeley pit. We talk about our wilderness, we talk about our rivers, we talk about our forests, we talk about our hunting and fishing, but we don't teach the history of how that happened. And I think if we taught the history of conservation as part of Montana history, then youth get the story that this activity is something quite noble and something quite extraordinary, as Shane pointed out in his speech the other, you know, yesterday, uh, unique in the world. And if that doesn't interest young people into participating, I think I'd miss my guess. And I think we need to do, uh, well, you know, start with Dr. Zeus and have a little hunting story rather than Bambi at the bedtime and bring that on up through all the, all the education levels. Maybe Ollie could jump in here. And, and you just uh, uh, burst uh, yet another bubble of self-esteem, Jim, by pointing out that economists are not at the top of the pyramid. <laughs> I, I know Fish and Game has uh, a huge amount of educational opportunities and outreach. Uh, we focused a lot of effort on training teachers. Uh, the Project Wild uh, curriculum is designed to be an aid to teachers at all levels, K through 12, in bringing wildlife concepts into the classroom uh, as part of reading, writing, and arithmetic. They're not standalones, and that's one of the challenges in today's education world is to bring these conservation concepts into our formal education uh, with the demand on, on performance-based testing in the classroom. We have to integrate those concepts into each of those primary curriculums, and uh, our Project Wild staff that the department has uh, works very creatively with teachers uh, across the state to do that. I had a conversation with a gentleman at the break. Can we integrate this into our history and civics uh, classes so that they are much as Jim described present? It is, and is this not one of the things that you need more resources for to ramp up to scale? Certainly we rely heavily on volunteers for this program and we do have small amounts of money available for grants and materials and supplies, but certainly continual support to our educators out there in the classroom uh, for all the demands they have is important and we simply aren't up to that task uh, totally. Uh, it's one of the things that did show up on the lists that we had up on the board uh, was, you know, more involvement in education and, and certainly that's the case. 
I can't let this opportunity go by real quick, though, to point out and, and embarrass the three youth that I believe we have in the audience here today. And I'm going to ask the three of you to stand up because we do or have more than them. three. Yeah. And if I've missed any, I believe there's one here with Chad, there's your granddaughter over here, and against the wall. And so we need to recognize yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, very good. Oh, fourth. And a fourth I missed. I did not see you down there. So we do have some youth here that are enduring uh, the stories and the, <laughs> and the lost opportunities they have may have elsewhere. Uh, the conversation I had during the break was, I'd much rather be out there on the Boise River right now than sitting in here, but we appreciate your patience with us. I, I, I was hoping that they're going to learn to avoid buck fever by my story. Uh, I want to offer also just an unsolicited testimonial very quickly. Uh, my wife is a first grade teacher of many years, and just last year she uh, uh, contacted Fish and Game and got involved with a bird watching for youth program where they gave them bird feeders and seed, and, and, and she was just really struck uh, both by the personal attention that they were able to bring to her class, uh, but also by the way that that became a vehicle to, to spark the curiosity about the world that, that makes them you know, lifelong learners and carries them through the rest of the grades. Shane? I don't think there's any doubt that we need to educate young people about the history of conservation. But it seems to me that the missing step that's absolutely essential is that we have to educate the general adult public of our nations on this continent about this story. It seems a little bit simplistic to me to say that what we want to do is to get this story into our school system when we know that the gatekeepers of the school system are very often the adults who do not know the story itself. Now that seems to me to be a completely non-strategic recipe for repetitively beating your head against a brick wall. <clears throat> Furthermore, the story is complicated, and the story needs, therefore, to be told first and understood to adult minds who can have the maturity to make the connection between citizenship and conservation, and then they can open the doors to the educational institutions. I've worked with the state of Texas over the last two years and the Dallas Safari Club to develop a curriculum for high schools in your country based first of all upon Texas teaching standards, which as you know, along with Florida, are the sort of standards of the nation, and then to create it or build it up to the national teaching standards using teachers and educators to do this. We have the curricula developed for literature, for history, already. We have it. But simply having the product is not enough. We have to find people who control the gateways, who are convinced that this is of merit to the education of children. I do not look to a broad uh, social media dispersion of the beauties of algebra to start a social movement amongst young people demanding that it be always with them. What we seek is to find an intelligent, thoughtful citizenry in the adult domain who understand the value of teaching mathematics and gradually introduce that to young minds who through that process discover the beauty in it. I think we have failed to develop the strategy for education in both our countries with respect to conservation for that very reason. If we had enough money right now and we had enough people who were willing to stand up in the educational system in your country, we already have the product already done. It's two years old. 
Great. Okay. Now I want to uh, keep the the focus here on Shane. We have a number of questions coming for Shane. First, I want to kind of summarize a broad family of comments that came in, uh, suggesting that let's see if I can capture this that Shane's uh, discussion be replayed on Outdoor Idaho, be uh, presented to all the uh, media in the state of Idaho, and there were a bunch of suggestions that culminated in suggesting that we bring Shane before a combined session of the Idaho legislature. <laughs> I, I, I think the bottom, help line, Idaho. <laughs> the bottom line of that is, uh, is a statement, of, I think, about how impactful uh, our mes your message was yesterday. Uh, so my first question for you, uh, do those who hire an outfitter or guide or pay for access to hunt come from some lower ethical standard than those who hunt and fish on their own? A loaded question, perhaps. I've had a lot of experience with this question um, because uh, it's always an issue of debate within a state or a province about people who come from uh, other regions and who engage the services of an outfitter or people who even within the state or province do so. My own personal belief is that uh, no. I think if people pursue the activity lawfully under fair chase conditions um, but rely on the advice and experience of people who can bring them to a portion of the country or region they're not familiar with or engage with an animal that they're not particularly familiar with, then I do not see them as pursuing hunting in a less ethical way than I do when I hunt the places that I know in Newfoundland very well. I think the, the value, furthermore, of being able to bring people from out of region or even from within a region to regions they don't know is that it expands the awareness of people within a nation or within a state or within a province of the diverse opportunities and the diverse beauty that is available to them. And the more fulsomely we are able to describe the narrative of wildness across the landscapes in the places we live and in the places we visit to hunt, I think the more valuable it is for all of wildlife conservation. Thank you. On a sidebar conversation or note, I would just say that during the break, I had a conversation uh, with an outfitter about bringing a friend of mine who was an Idaho native, uh, bringing his son back to Idaho to have uh, perhaps a, a more successful <laughs> experience than my own on as far as his first deer. Okay, uh, next question. Beyond the United States uh, in the 1930s, uh, is there any, currently, is there any uh, entity, either an organization or a country, who excites you with their work to affect large scale change in the area of conservation? There are armies of people around the world fighting for the conservation of wildlife. And the reason is, is because those creatures wherever they occur, inspire us to do great things. They made us human. The only way we could ever figure out that we were something different was by putting ourselves in contradistinction to them. We weren't taught this by anybody. They taught us this. Um, there are some brilliant examples of places that are doing extraordinary things. Costa Rica, with the massive set-aside of wild land for the protection of biodiversity and the courage to explore the model that would see tourism-based financial generation being able to support the economy and lives of people in their country is a, is a great example. It works there, it may not work everywhere. We have circumstances where if we look at the issue of hunting in places like South Africa, Namibia, where I can assure you that if there wasn't hunting and largely private land hunting, the amount of wildlife in those two nations would be probably somewhere around 10% of what it currently is today. And then we see circumstances like across the European Union where a whole range of very diverse countries, cultures with extraordinary histories are able yet to keep wildlife with them 
If you were to visit a tiny country like Slovenia, for example, a tiny, tiny little speck on the map, and see the tiny country in which they maintain large numbers, relatively speaking, of European brown bear, when they take you to the one valley through which those monstrous carnivores move, you really have to be inspired. I wrote an article when I returned from there and asked, how many grizzlies would we have left in North America if we had such a small piece of land and so many people? There are inspiring stories everywhere. Humanity is one, and our imagination and commitment to the natural world is what keeps us afloat. Thank you. Um, we, we talked some, this is a couple of questions here from Idaho Falls. Uh, we, we talked some about, uh, uh, I think it's a relative minority of, of the public who have no interest in wildlife. And the question is, do you have suggestions for how to engage those with no interest in wildlife into the conservation dialogue? I've many times posited the argument over this issue to um, educators and people from large cities who wonder about this question in particular. But if you gave me a classroom of five-year-olds and put one child from every nation in the world in that room, and even if you chose all of those children from the heart of cities, and I would bring into that room the best of mechanical toys that human genius had ever invented and let them each choose the one they wanted. That after some time, if I then brought into that room a Labrador puppy <laughs> or a frog or a terrarium or a caribou calf or even the skull of a rhino, I guarantee you that every child in that room will turn his and her little back on the mechanical toy. And I'll also guarantee you something else. If you see a child that doesn't, be concerned. Because it is innate to the ordinary human experience to be fascinated by the wild others. Those people who have no interest, so-called, are people who have never had the chance to see, to touch, to smell, to experience wild creatures. I am of the absolute committed opinion I have seen it the world over. You show people something wild. They may be fearful, they may be intrigued, they may be beguiled, but they will not be impassive. I don't believe there are people uninterested in wildlife, just people who have not yet expressed it. And, and if you'll pan over here, you'll see uh, Ali is nodding along to that last answer. I'm glad to have made my point. <laughs> <laughs> our next question, um, uh, again, kind of maybe going back to a little bit of our conservation history, uh, and, and they asked the question, is it even possible in, in today's political climate to have another national leader like Teddy Roosevelt who could lead and inspire without accidentally committing political suicide? This is, a, this is a question you'd like to be able to answer very flippantly, but this is a very, very complicated question in today's world. There aren't many places that afford the unique combination of circumstances that threw up Teddy Roosevelt. A young nation, a massive continent, a belief that the world was still completely open to every single opportunity, economies that were more self-contained, people who were more self-reliant. That combination is not so easily found, obviously, anymore. However, the commitments that he made at the time he made them were not favorably received by necessarily even a majority of his colleagues, certainly not his political colleagues. And they were not even received in the majority, certainly with favor from the perspective of industry and the masters of capitalism in this country. 
but he did it nevertheless. Courage to make change for the natural world is, I believe, a commodity that is rising on the political sphere, more so in Europe than it is in this country or in Canada, unfortunately. But I do believe that disaster is on our side. Because by the time we approach 8 billion, 9 billion, and whatever, we will have come to learn that the greatest leadership that we can demand from our political personages is going to be how to safeguard those natural resources. As Gwyn Dyer, the big military strategist who your own Pentagon periodically hires on extended contract has indicated, if you want a nuclear war, look to water. So do I think it's possible? Of course, every time and has thrown up truly great people and they still exist and I think the pressures will be on us ever more for those people to emerge, to have the scale of impact that Roosevelt and his group of people around him had will be very hard to imagine. But nevertheless, I know people who carry these convictions and who are in the political arena, and I think what they need is the support from us. Someone has to stand at their backs. And, and doesn't sometimes uh, the, the circumstances of the moment can sometimes uh, serve to pull a person out to, to, to meet the demands of that moment? Yes, I mean, uh, you know, you have, <clears throat> you know, you have uh, setting aside the political feelings of people in this room or diversely across the country, I mean, on the issue of climate change, you did obviously have a very high-placed political figure in this country who played a significant role in advocating that issue globally. Uh, people may disagree on climate change. We may disagree on what has caused climate change. But I think most of us are coming to realize that something wacky is going on. We've got sun in Newfoundland. There's a, there's a clear indication. <laughs> so, um, you know, but there's an example of where a political personage, again from your country, who stood up and exercised a considerable amount of courage in advancing this. Uh, and as I said, we might debate it, but we cannot change the fact that somebody of a political background did engage in the way they did. Good, good point. And I, I, I love uh, the comment by uh, the columnist uh, Thomas Friedman when he says, it shouldn't be called global warming, it's more properly called global weirding because there are all manner of weird climatic and disaster events that seem to be coming with increased frequency. Okay, uh, one, one last question uh, for you, Shane, and uh, the wording on this one is, is a bit awkward, but let's see if I can get it out here. Um, do you see a way to engage national leaders to help citizens accept their responsibility for wildlife habitat and to become willing to uh, tax themselves for that purpose? Um, <clears throat> yes, of course I do, um, and I also engage a great deal with people in elected office, very commonly both at the national level in Canada and at the provincial level. And I want to make one statement right, right off. There are a great many people elected to political office, and the vast, vast majority of all of them I have met have entered the political arena for the right reasons. It's become very common for us to denigrate politicians. I think it's at our own peril. I've met hardly any that have ever been in there for totally self-serving purposes. But I would switch the question around. While I know there are people in political office who are able and are showing leadership, we don't often always hear them because it's a big debate internally, but nevertheless they are there. I think the real issue is do we have a sufficient movement amongst our people to have people elected who know that when they go to represent us, that that conservation is one of our primary concerns. You know, I think it's true that we get the governments we deserve. And 
I really believe that if we were speaking to the elected officials we have all the time and saying, look, we are concerned about education and we are concerned about health and we're not Panglossian. We don't think the world is unfolding exactly everywhere in the best of all possible ways. And we do understand basic economics and know that there's not enough money to do all the things. And we are concerned for our people across the board. But we think the conservation of the natural resources of our state, provinces, and nations are a vitally important issue. And we want to see this talked about in the halls of parliament and in the halls of Congress. And if you don't deliver on that, then that's one area where you have failed to deliver on what we believe in. Do you really think we're giving that message to our legislators, to our elected officials? Because if you're able to say you are in the state of Idaho, I say good for you, because not many other places are. Okay. Well, uh, next we are going to go into uh, what I think in College Bowl they used to call the toss-up questions. Uh, <laughs> questions for all of the panel. I have two sets of questions. First is for all of the panel, and then uh, I want to shift into a second set of questions that will begin to aim us more towards decisions about uh, the pathway forward. Uh, so. Uh, here, the first question uh, comment uh, was worded like this. Uh, Governor Otter would like to, quote, get the feds off our back, unquote, on a number of wildlife issues. What role do you see for the federal government? Who wants to jump in there? <laughs> Virgil, I, I'm sh I know you're not anxious to speak for the governor, but let's just strip away that first part and what role do you see for the federal government? I think I'm going to pass this to Ollie. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, um, those of us who know Governor Otter uh, know his feelings on the state being better at managing many things than the federal government. At the same time, there are legitimate and important roles for the federal aspects of wildlife management in this nation. Not all wildlife is born, survives, and dies within the boundaries of a state. Many do, and we're quite capable and organized to manage those wildlife that have life histories that are expressed within those geopolitical boundaries. But we also have wildlife that span vast geopolitical boundaries. And we have a role that has been accommodated with that, migratory waterfowl being the most notable and successful of our conservation strategies in the North American continent that includes Mexico, United States, and the Canadian provinces. Without that federal oversight, that federal management, and, and interaction with the states and the other countries, we simply would not have the waterfowl and migratory birds that this nation enjoys and appreciates. That is an appropriate role, I believe, for our federal aspects, our United States, to work <coughs> together on more wildlife management. Uh, Virgil, uh, a, a follow-up question. Uh, the federal government is the state's largest landlord in as far as owning public lands. Can you speak about uh, uh, your, the role, maybe your own uh, ability to offer input into land use planning by the federal government on uh, national forests and BLM holdings? Certainly the federal land management agencies are our biggest landlord in the state and they have the management responsibility for our wildlife uh, in terms of the habitat component. Um, they are a partner, the Forest Service and the BLM, in, in maintaining that. I, I think it is very important, and this is something I do know where the governor is at, and that is that we do call the shots, though, relative to wildlife population and wildlife population management goals outside of those federal nexus things, such as migratory waterfowl, or those that might be under some other federal program, such as the Endangered Species Act. And it's important that that partnership have the proper balance, and that we become the uh, important component in setting and managing the wildlife on all of those uh, lands that are out there. At the same time, those land managers and the federal government have uh, tremendous diversity of responsibilities 
uh, for the habitats that are there for food and fiber and other things. And so we have to have a respect uh, for that aspect. But, um, and so there is a role there, but certainly the increasing uh, dominance of federal decisions that don't take into account the state responsibilities for wildlife are troubling to the governor, and his comments were directed toward that. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, otherwise, uh, this next one, uh, maybe Tony, you'd take the first shot. Jim, and, and Jim. Oh, Jim, you have something. Go ahead, grab the mic, please. Now I understand the seating. Now I understand the seating arrangement here. Somebody's going to be on the far left. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Which kind of dangerous here, I understand that. But I think the, the notion of getting the feds off our back is kind of a cliche. I'm quite convinced that we're going to be called upon not to get them off our back, but to save them. I mean, we have this rich public land estate that we all hunt on and that we all cherish, and they <laughs> are experiencing and have off and on through their own history uh, a diminishing capacity to meet all the things we ask of them. and. and in my personal experience, like right now, uh, it's the NGO community, the local NGO community, that's uh, filling the gaps. We're, we are cleaning up trails, we're restoring uh, facilities, we're building wildlife databases to, so that they can meet all the requirements that are being asked of them. Uh, one example is, uh, and this is my wife's doing all this, but she's a retired wildlife biologist and she's leading a group of volunteers to monitor grizzly bear distribution and movement by collecting uh, grizzly bear hair samples. All of it being done by volunteers locally. And as I mentioned earlier, we're all given many opportunities to comment and participate and uh, local people are the ones who can do that. And I think if we're going to save this public land estate that we value, it's going to require hands-on volunteer work. And uh, the one other thing that I guess I would throw into the mix uh, that we're not doing and that, that I think we must do is, you know, these individuals in the federal agencies quite often are transient. And I think we need to find ways and, and time to educate them on the conservation history of the place that you all know so intimately. You know the many battles that have been fought to prevent damming of rivers and to make sure forest timber sales and road systems are compatible with wildlife needs and, and conservation. And I think these transient land managers uh, need to have a, sort of a, a briefing when they show up so that they can appreciate all the volunteer investment that's already gone in. And uh, maybe I'd also suggest that in the future we should start keeping a record of the extent of that, where volunteers would be earning something like conservation credits uh, that are measured and appreciated. And uh, I'm going to use the moderator's prerogative just to offer a observation on the current political climate. Uh, if we as a nation managed to fall off the fiscal cliff and trigger mandatory federal budget cutbacks uh, as of the first of the year, it's my belief that rural America and rural landscapes are going to take one of the biggest hits from that action. Tony. Yeah, I, I would add that I think from our perspective, um, state government plays an important role, federal government plays an important role, county government, local. Um, I think the value is having a baseline of which we can all know that there's going to be some consistency from state to state. I think you could use the same argument and say, why are there state laws? Let all 44 counties in Idaho set their own laws. And you can see pretty quickly that you get chaos if you don't have some consistency knowing how things are going to go from state to state. I think the bigger dilemma is which decisions should be made at which levels. And I think that's really the question and where people get into it the most is whether that should be a federal decision or a state decision or a local decision. And I, and I think that's a, a meaningful conversation to have. But, but I think all of those play an important role. And, and I know if you look at from a standpoint of having each state recreate the wheel, whether it's science, 
you know, that gets pretty expensive. There's a lot of things that the federal government can do that states can't do because they have the capacity to do it. And then all of the states can share in that and that becomes an economic savings as well for the states. And Tony, keep the uh, microphone right there because that was a great segue into our, the next question, which is what is the role of fishing game, conservation groups, and others in ter uh, on the effect of development on wildlife? You know, before the Great Recession, we were seeing a great number of subdivisions platted and planned communities proposed, and it was really kind of spreading out. Uh, uh, it's paused now for the last few years, but it's about to renew. And, and, and a related question to this is, uh, you know, t are there tools available to local governments to help encourage wildlife conservation in land use planning? So I, I would say from, from the NGO, the, the nonprofit sector, that's where for like the Nature Conservancy, I think we've been able to be very effective. That's something that we've been able to focus on which is the habitat fragmentation and the concern about development occurring in areas where you're gonna block migration corridors, where we've got prime habitat. So that's an area that we really have focused on. And to our benefit, we've had a lot of partners who have also seen that to be really important. We've had a lot of donors, and that's where conservation easements, actually purchasing property, putting conservation easements on it, and then turning the property back around. Um, has, has been very effective. So that's, that's an important role that we play and something that we think we can help state government do fish and game that maybe they can't always do on their own or getting the property and transferring it over to them so that they can continue to manage it. So I think it is an important, an important role that we play. And, and stay right there for, although I want others weighing in on this next one. Uh, so developers, that was kind of one stakeholder group to uh, ask around. Here is another one was, how could, uh, this one from Lewiston, how can we increase the participation of women in the full spectrum of wildlife activities? And I, I, I just, I would add, I said, perhaps at, at least here in Boise, there's women made up 25% of the audience, something like that. Yeah, I noticed that on the poll as well, and I'd be curious to see what it is uh, through, throughout the state. Um, and I, I would be interested in getting Virgil's take on this as well, because I'm sure Fish and Game has, has dealt with this issue um, as well. You know, I'll use for an example my daughter, maybe um, as an example, somebody who is very active um, in the outdoors. Again, that's because she had a mom and a family that was very active in the outdoors. So I think, again, it starts young, exposing them to those kinds of things trying to get a peer group that also wants to do those kinds of things with them is really, uh, really important. I know, you know, you start getting to junior high and some of her friends that she hiked with and did things with before started gaining other interests. So I think you have to maintain that presence uh, throughout. But I think also then trying to allow them to find the activity that's right for them. Um, you know, maybe it's uh, fly fishing or something, working really hard to find the activity that sort of resonates with them that they can feel good about. But again, I think trying to find some peers and a social circle that encourages that is really important. Virgil? Certainly our most underrepresented group is women in, in traditional outdoor sports or in organized groups. We see that across the state. It's just a fact. Um, I believe as the father of two daughters, uh, that there is uh, wisdom in the words that Tony just said. It's exposure. It is being sure that they have the opportunity that's appropriate uh, at whatever stage they are at in their growth, just like any child. It doesn't make any difference. And uh, at the same time, recognizing and truthfully recognizing that those peer support mechanisms are very important. Becoming an outdoor woman is a is a mechanism one such mechanism that is available as well as other group related activities that allow women to mentor women to a large degree which does help tremendously and uh, I think there is some uh, discussion that needs to occur within the NGO community about recruiting and retaining the energy that comes from that and, and being sure that our activities are gauged to that appropriately to mentor uh, that forward. Um, so it, 
Certainly it can be done. My wife is a huge influence in the mentoring of my daughters. And, and so it doesn't just occur on the male side. It's a, it's a family, and this is a family out here, and we need to give some consideration to how to best do that. Shane or Jim? Yeah, when we had the question previously about can we expect another Theodore Roosevelt to show up, <laughs> if I had a chance at that one, I would have said, well, she's out there. <laughs> yes, there's some and, um, My wife, full disclosure, she was the first female to go through the wildlife curriculum at Montana State University, and it was a huge challenge for her. <laughs> and as a person who was administering a state wildlife agency, I later learned that these young ladies that were coming into the program were quite different personality-wise than the males I was hiring. All the males I were hiring, why well, these were guys who wanted to be hermits. And all the females were, were, were ladies that wanted to challenge the system and believed that there was nothing they couldn't do. And so they were, uh, it was kind of an interesting mixture at that point of our evolution. And I think, of course, we're beyond that now. But uh, anyhow, that was my offering. I was going to tell a funny story just on the flip side, but it demonstrates the point that kids, you know, emulate what they see. Uh, and someone I work with, his, his wife is a lawyer and she has a large circle of female lawyer friends. And she was telling me that one of the cutest things was when her son was about four, she introduced him to another peer who happened to be a man. And he said to her, you mean men can be lawyers too? <laughs> <laughs> and I will just say for me, I try to keep up with my women kayaker friends. Sometimes unsuccessfully. Okay, two more stakeholder groups to uh, uh, bring into the discussion. Uh, one is that we haven't talked a whole lot about, uh, we've talked about NGOs, talked about government, we haven't talked a whole lot about the private sector. Uh, so this question, uh, it came from both Lewiston and Pocatello. How can we engage the many businesses that benefit from outdoor tourism and recreation into the wildlife and conservation partnership? After all, they have skin in this game. You know, and then a second one, uh, it kind of talks about maybe a new Idaho conservation model uh, that would engage uh, the, the private sector players. Anyone? Okay, I'll take a shot at that. Our business community are, uh, to me, are some of our huge partners. Um, Outdoor-based recreation is huge in this state. Uh, Wildlife-based recreation is huge in this state. It's a $1.4 billion spending activity uh, with the latest surveys we've done. Um, that's somewhere between 1.5 and 2% of all of the economic activity of this state that has a foundation in wildlife, hunting, fishing, wildlife viewing. Um, we can quantify those numbers and substantiate those numbers. and so. The business communities of this state have uh, a large stake in that. You don't have to look very far at the Department of Commerce or the, uh, the tourism or the advertising in almost any publication that's trying to recruit people to come to this state and spend money to see wildlife, wildlife in a great, beautiful setting, a picture of someone fishing or someone watching wildlife and hunting. Those icons are used commonly in the business community to recruit folks to what it is we know is an important part of our, our reason to live here in Idaho. Now, how do we engage them in this discussion? Uh, how do we get them bound to us? Many of our businesses are. They are very active and supportive of what we're doing. You see them, if you look through the brochure, as contributors to this wildlife summit. They're not your traditional NGOs, but you see some of those folks that have a belief and understanding, I think, of that important um, economic activity that is in this state. Uh, certainly, though, um, we need to have deeper and stronger conversations and, and understandings between our business leaders in this state and the importance of wildlife to the state. And so it's something that I have personally tried to reach out on over the years. I believe having economic information that gives folks locally information that they can understand. Uh, we have economic information on fishing on practically every body of water in the state. 
We have economic information for every state or county at the county level that can help both businesses and county leaders uh, understand how to how to utilize resources in their local arena. And, and sometimes you've even talked in terms of economic impact. Right, and and economic impact. And so I could I could rattle on on this forever, but the point being, in terms of what we're trying to do here, and that is talk about conservation, talk about how to advance and sustain the conservation ethic that Shane speaks so eloquently about. Uh, we need to find those business leaders that are out there, both large and small, whether they be the Idaho Power Companies or the Ocala hand restaurants and other folks out there, and engage them in a leadership role in this conservation movement. Okay, the last stakeholder group I want to inquire about is kind of the transition question towards uh, uh, the call to action. Um, and that, this question from Idaho Falls, how do we reconcile over the overwhelming majority support found in the survey for wildlife, uh, 90, I don't know how many percent, with those self-same citizens electing legislators who do not support regulations or agencies that support wildlife habitat? And, and we have a couple of out-of-staters who might be a better position to <laughs> take first shot at that one. Go ahead. <laughs> got your back. <laughs> Restate. Uh, how do we reconcile that there is overwhelming support for wildlife and yet these same people who express that support for wildlife in the privacy of the voting booth are electing very conservative legislators who are not supporting uh, policies that support wildlife? Well, as close as I can come to explain something like that, and I'm not a political scientist, but this isn't the only issue that uh, the political machine parades in front of the electorate. And I don't think it uh, would be too much of a stretch to say those of us who cannot avoid watching the campaigning that's going on and the, the banal nature that it's taken, uh, where the the purpose is not to illuminate brilliant ideas and solutions, but to degrade your opponent. And uh, finding pollsters focusing on narrow sound bites that people might passionately be, believe in. And wildlife and fisheries and conservation is somewhere in a, in a huge blender with all these other issues. And I guess until we can decide that this issue is so important to enough of us that it can become a game changer. And uh, I know I'm in the campaigns going on in Montana today, they're pretty much what I just described. And I personally have access to many of the candidates to try to, and try to talk them into rolling out a natural resource plank but their pollsters say that's not the issue this time, and so we don't even know where they stand on those issues. So you're kind of making a variation on the nice guys finish last argument. Well, I hope not. <laughs> but anyone else on this one? <clears throat> I think partly we maybe do ourselves a bit of disservice because I'm not sure we speak very well with a collective voice. Um, and I'm not sure we have connected all those dots to show those politicians that collectively this group of people who are made up of a lot of different people from a lot of different walks of life all care about that. So we sit in a room and we see that, but I think the voices that we speak with out there um, tend to come to the politicians not necessarily as a collective voice, but as a more fragmented voice. And so I think you know we have that obligation to say, coming out of this, so when you talk about what's the value of this for me, it's how do we come out of this collectively to give that message to legislators that this is important to us and it's one of the things that we will be evaluating when we're choosing who to support. And I think we can do a better job collectively as an organization, a big group, saying that and, and sending that message. Okay, uh, 
now this next set of questions I'd like, uh, Virgil may want to take the lead, but uh, please weigh in if, if you have something to say on this as well. This first was a set, a rather large set of questions around marketing. Uh, one person said, we have a great product in, in Idaho in our wildlife, why not sell it professionally to the nation? Another couple of questions suggested marketing as a way to create a more positive view of hunting and fishing. And another suggested it would also create a more positive view of uh, Idaho Department of Fish and Game actions. Another suggested that uh, we needed, uh, the agency needed some marketing help to explain uh, its budget, how, what it's spending money on, why it needs more resources, and so on. Uh, do you have a response to these call uh, suggestions that marketing may be a skill that you could make use of? as an agency? Certainly the term, we need professional help, comes to mind. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to say that. <laughs> um, and, and I do believe, as most of the professional staff in our organization are not associated with marketing. I don't know whether we have anybody out here in this group that has a professional marketing background, uh, but certainly many of those comments that were rolled up into that question from folks out there, hit on some very important issues that we are keenly aware of. What I can tell you is marketing does work. Where we have tried it, we have seen responses. But it is difficult to place into a budget that is stretched already large quantities of money directed to marketing strategies when we're not totally certain of what we're going to get back in a response. But um, I believe that it is an area we have to move into, and truly I believe it is an arena that as a wildlife professional, as an administrator, uh, that we do need to seek and gain professional help on. Uh, again, we have a national marketing effort for fishing going on uh, that is transcending agencies, and, and state boundaries. We know over the last 10 years that that has produced a positive benefit. The Take Me Fishing campaign has been very well thought out and supported by industry and the states, and, but we don't have a comparable one for conservation in general, and we don't have one that's comparable for outdoor-based wildlife recreation or even hunting. And, and so we need to learn from and look at how we can bring, come together as communities, business people, wildlife conservationist agencies to see if we can do local as well as broad scale marketing. I mean, the, you think of some of the marketing campaigns that have been successful, you know, Got Milk. Those are the kinds of campaigns that get people's attention and, and stick in their minds. So when it's talking about our conservation needs for this nation, I'm not sure we can get it into two words but certainly we need to think about marketing and strategies to get that message out there. Jim? Yeah, and I think Director Moore kind of answered what I was twitching about over here. We have to decide what we're marketing, yeah. whether it's what Idaho has sure. or how Idaho got what it has. And if we get a little precision in the target, I think it's be a good deal. Okay, uh, Director Moore, here's a nice softball that I, I just had to <laughs> toss. Uh, th this uh, question and comment from Lewiston. Can we have summits like these annually? I've learned so much here and would like them to continue. I hear some manacle laughing out of the staff <laughs> in the back of the room that have put this thing together and the amount of energy it, it takes to pull off uh, an activity like that. But uh, certainly, summits of this scale are, are monumental events, and, and the contributions that it took from many of you, the NGOs and the supporters out here, are large. And, and like trying financial to pull, and time. Financial and time. At the same time, we are always committed to improving public discourse on wildlife issues, and doing something on a local basis annually is on my list of things to have discussions about. I'm not ready to make that commitment because I'm not sure uh, how, how well we would be able to deliver on that. 
but I want to um, make that commitment here that certainly the opportunity for us to come back together in a routine fashion to ensure we're moving forward and I'll talk about that just a little bit as we wrap up here and you, you'll see here that I, I'm moving right towards the, the the last thing on our agenda which is talking about next steps so fear not if we go over by a couple of minutes the, uh, this next question I think is is rather important uh, um, how will you protect hunter and angler rights and privileges when you begin to get non-game groups helping with funding and as I read this another way that you might say it is can you help create a firewall that will address uh, our, our fears that uh, uh, a, a larger uh, audience is going to somehow erode uh, traditional uses of wildlife well I guess that one is directed at me but it's also directed at our Commission uh, and I, I the to me the the answer to that question is the question is by and large unfounded uh, we currently spend a fair amount of resources on all of wildlife in this state we have the license plate program and the check off program they're a small proportion of the budget yes but with matching grants it it is several millions of dollars not tens of millions unfortunately there is not a state out there that has a broadened their base of financial support uh, that I could talk to their directors and they've told me this that hunting and fishing isn't stronger and better managed now than it was before they had those broader resources available to them the need to build a firewall between I don't believe is there in fact I think it's tearing down the walls that are between that are necessary to get this conservation uh, needs of all wildlife taken care of um, and the summit has been about tearing I down mean, walls certainly and fences. we see states that we look at and say oh my gosh I don't want that to happen here uh, the the recent issues in California with the president of their commission come to mind over his killing a cougar in the state of Idaho uh, get it out there on the table and I don't see a series of events in Idaho that would ever lead to that because we're not California and I don't believe we ever will be uh, but certainly that is the fear that's out there and and I don't I believe properly done where we have good discourse across the bounds that those will not happen here uh, my home state of Missouri one of the original states to get a broadened income tax based revenue that's dedicated to all wildlife has done this successfully for over 25 years uh, to the tunes of tens of millions if not hundreds of millions of dollars for all wildlife they have better access now one of those issues that's important to everybody they have better wildlife management and private property programs and in school education programs all of the things that are important on that list you put up there and hunting and fishing is better there than it was when I was a kid I can go back to the family farm and attest to that personally so it is something I'm aware of but with a rare exception in this nation the states that have it the couple of the dozen or so states that have it simply haven't experienced that so that's my response okay uh, uh, Virgil I have several more changes you want to go ahead I think this is a really important point um, and needs to be discussed. The tension that arises over trying to expand the base of support for conservation that is raised from some percentage of us in the hunting world is a reality we have to deal with. But my own personal belief is that somebody is going to lead this next revolution in conservation. We've had two before, one when we founded it, one in the 1930s, and we're in the midst of another one now. Whether we wish to accept that or not doesn't really matter. It, believe me, it is underway. And I believe fundamentally in the sustainable use movement. I believe that hunting can be a truly important conservation mechanism not so much 
for what it does for the populations of wildlife we hunt, but more so for the transformative power it can have in turning those who pursue animals in that lethal fashion into individuals who are deeply committed to their survival. And I believe that the hunting public needs to get over this fear. I believe that we have to understand how strong we are. We are the best organized fraternity, organization, institution, association, whatever you wish to call it, in the conservation movement. And the evidence of that is the enormous, enormous amounts of money and, inf and the enormous amounts of influence we in fact already have. We need to lead by being generous. We need to lead by being open. We need to lead by welcoming people of all kinds in the support of wildlife. Our influence should not be based only on the amount of money we generate, but on the ideas and passion and commitment we give to wildlife. Our agencies have proven that they listen to all kinds of groups who do not necessarily pay the freight. They pay attention to people who are concerned about non-game. They pay attention to biodiversity in the broadest sense. It is, to some extent, an irrational fear. And we need to get over it. We won't lose. We will gain by being more open in this new effort for conservation, in my view. We must remember we're 6 or 7 percent of the population of this nation. Times are changing. Right now, we have 77 percent of the American people in support of legal fair chase hunting. Will it last forever? How far does it need to fall before the legislators that we think are defending what we do may be forced to change their minds because of a change in populist opinion? We will keep the citizenry with us because of what we do in conserving wildlife and speaking out on behalf of wild creatures. And I think all creatures, in fact, being concerned about their lives and how they're treated. And I think we need to be far, far bolder in our embrace of all attitudes that are pointing in the important direction of doing the best things for wildlife. We have nothing to be afraid of, everything to be proud of, and an extraordinary record of achievement. And the moderate, large majority of the American people and the Canadian people and the citizens of the world will understand that when the story is told honestly and truthfully. Right. Well, I ha there are a whole family of questions here in the neighborhood of going forward around fees, and I think what I'm going to do is just rattle off the topics of them, and then uh, we'll thank our panel and allow uh, first Virgil and then Shane to uh, make a more uh, cohesive closing statement. If that's all right with you, Virgil? So, uh, you know, I, will, I do, do want to acknowledge there were a, a bunch of questions about the size of miscellaneous revenues and whatnot, and I think you'll be able to find those if you go back and look at the PowerPoint presentation that he made on Friday in a little more detail. Uh, there were questions about the value of in-kind and volunteer labor to fish and game, and I know it's substantial. Uh, there was a question about whether the agency has uh, uh, done a organized review of revenue options used by other states and, and places uh, and, and a lot of suggestions about particular revenue options and I think that's all part of your next uh, steps kind of conversation. Uh, there, was, there were several questions asking for maybe a clarification of your intention with regard to resident license fees and there were several hopeful questions about whether or not uh, the state of Idaho could be persuaded to, to invest general account uh, tax revenue into uh, fish and game uh, and wildlife activities. All of these, I, I think, I'm hopeful, are things that you might be speaking to uh, in a moment. So uh, let us give a big round of applause for our panel today. Thank you very much to Tony Hardesty, to Jim Posowitz, Shane Mahoney, and Virgil Moore.